Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and joining me back to the show is my awkward duet partner, my colleague, my friend, and inspiration, Karen Eber. Karen Eber is an author, leadership consultant, and keynote speaker. Her TED Talk on how your brain responds to stories continues to inspire millions, well over 2 million views. So check it out. Her book, The Perfect Story, How to Tell Stories That Inform, Influence, and Inspire was selected as a Next Big Ideas Club must read and published with HarperCollins last October. As the CEO and chief storyteller of Eber Leadership Group, Karen helps Fortune 500 companies like GE, Microsoft, and Kate Spade build leaders, teams, and cultures one story at a time. She guest lectures at universities, including MIT, London Business School, and Stanford. She is a former head of culture, learning, and leadership development at GE and Deloitte, and frequently contributes to and is featured in Fast Company, MSN, Quartz, Entrepreneur, New York Post, Forbes, NPR, and Business Insider. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so happy to be here. It has been a long time coming. Yes, what people don't realize is that there was, and there was a lot of reasons for rescheduling. Like I was sick, I couldn't, I, I, anyway, we're here and we get to talk about your book and we're going to highlight your book in the month of April, I think, is going to be our focus of, you don't know this yet, Karen. We're going to be reaching out to you. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, and highlighting your your work in our newsletter. Oh. I realized I was like, I think Jessica hasn't connected with you yet. This is off. This conversation's off to a great start, folks. Okay. Karen, for those of you who may remember, she was on the show during our first season. And, you know, we were at the time you were still writing your book, The Perfect Story. So since last time we met, what would be important for us to know about your world? Uh, this is when, as a storyteller, my mind goes blank, and I'm like, I don't know nothing. <laughs> uh, first, always, always a treat and honor to be in conversation with you. Um, the last time we met, I was in the throes of writing, and um, writing is so fun to me. I love that. The marketing part is the part where you like learn so much about yourself, and you get to yeah. connect with all of these people and have these amazing experiences. So I've been on a roller coaster up and yeah. down, and here we are, slightly nauseous, but definitely forward. <laughs> uh, it is clear that you enjoy writing in your book. That you can, there is a level of intentionality in. And there always is, right? Authors are always being really intentional. But that was something that was very clear to me reading your book of how thoughtful you were on these are the examples that I think are going to best support these ideas, which no surprise is your whole thesis of how stories can support it. Okay, before we get into the content of the book, I'm just curious, you know, what what has surprised you or what is something that has surprised you on this journey of authorship um, from writing the book to where you are now? That was just something new and unexpected. There were a couple of things. The writing was enjoyable. That wasn't hard. I didn't really, you know, you often hear writers say, my house has never been cleaner and I can't tell you more about what's happening on social <laughs> media. I just fell into a discipline. I think part of it is I was not able to take off of work and write the book. I had to yeah. keep running my business and travel and do keynotes. And so I just somehow set a schedule and stuck to it. And there were you know a couple times where it was harder to grapple with it, but then I would go for a walk and it would be clear. So that part I loved. Um, the um, What surprised me that I wasn't prepared for is how cranky editing made me. And not because <laughs> I didn't think my work should improve. I did, but I'm not, you know, you often hear people say like, have a writing habit, right? An hour every day. That didn't work for me. I do better work where I can block like four, five, six hours at a time, work deeply and then go forward. So I would have like a full day blocked for editing. And that was the worst thing that I could do because when you're editing, 
you're not creating, you're looking for problems and mistakes and tightening and Mm -hmm. how can this be different? And you have a very different eye on your work. And so Mm -hmm. then I would get into the, this is awful. Is there anything good here? What are we doing? And I finally had to learn like, no, you edit for 90 minutes and then you go take a break. You do not do that because I was never more cranky than when I was editing. I, I, I actually loved the editing process. Did you? Probably more than the creation. Um, And I understand what you're saying. So for those of you who are listening, who are thinking about writing a book someday, it was one of the best pieces of advice I got from my publisher was, you will hate your manuscript at some point. You will think it's terrible at some point. And then you will just refine it and then you will find it. And um, and that was absolutely true as well. It doesn't surprise me to hear that you love the creation of it. And I, I do enjoy editing because I feel like the work comes yeah. out in editing. It wasn't that I didn't think it couldn't improve. I just recognize that while I could write for six, seven hours at a time, I couldn't edit for yeah. six, seven hours yeah. at a time. So that was different. Um, you know, there's other amazing things on the journey of – when you are reaching out for blurbs, you you kind of put this request out there and it hangs and you never quite know what you're going to get or if you're going to get it or when you're going to get it. And uh, I like to joke that Amy Edmondson made me cry. Because <laughs> That's right. I remember I that. Sent it off and I, I didn't know if I would hear from her. And like four days later, she's already in my inbox sending me really lovely notes and she wasn't even done reading it. Um, so there's there's these moments where people are just so kind to you and you realize, yeah. oh gosh, am I as kind to other people mm. when they're going through things? And then like we touched on, um, when your book is in the world, you get random messages from strangers that um, you can't even trace how mm-hmm. you know them or how they follow you. You're not even a second degree on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. You're a third and they're writing some message about how they found your book and how it helped you. I got one yesterday from someone in Thailand. <laughs> Don't know him, it. but really lovely. Yeah. So that's a, a really cool thing. It's the thing that you're hoping for when you're yeah. in the dregs doing the editing. <laughs> that's the other thing is just, you know, for people who read books, send messages to your author, favorite authors, because they appreciate it. And just to answer your question of am I as kind, you are a huge support for me during my process of just checking in emotional support. Hey, you're going to have dopamine s- spikes and then you're going to crash. And, and I, I've passed that along to other f- friends as they've written books and published. It's like, you're going to be inundated. What's your, what's your, like, what's your resourcing plan? What's your, what's your plan to take care of yourself uh, during, during this process? I do so, remember sending you yeah. a recording of the sun will come out tomorrow. On yeah. The piccolo. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to get your piccolo uh, responses. <laughs> so we're going to dig into your yeah. book, The Perfect Story. And I forget the subtitle. Yeah. How to Tell Stories stories that inform, influence, and inspire. Now, I I suspect that you run into this a lot. Um, I'm not a speaker, so I don't need to learn how to tell a good story. What would you like, what would you say? Who, who, who is your book for? Yeah, by the way, replace speaker with anything. Yeah, and I'm a leader, I so I don't need to. I'm, I'm a an mother, engineer, I don't need to. I'm in pharmaceuticals, I'm an yes. attorney. Yeah. Um, When you are writing a book proposal, you have to be very clear on who your audience is, uh, because obviously that's the business case for who's going to buy your book. And so the lead is people in business, because Mm -hmm. stories are a unit of understanding, and they're how we connect and how we communicate. However, (laughs) big fat asterisks. Um, What I learned through my TED Talk is stories aren't about presentations at work Mm -hmm. and they're not about sales conversations and they're not about marketing. They are truly about connection. And so many people outside of the business world responded to that. And so the intent is that whether you are giving a eulogy or you are guesting on a podcast or hosting a podcast, or you are getting ready for a presentation or you're an entrepreneur, the steps in this take you through how do you find ideas and tell stories for the perfect setting. Yeah, I don't believe that there's like the four stories you have to tell. I don't believe in that because if you follow that, you're going to hit an instance where those four stories won't apply. And so- The goal is to give you the tools to put that together for whatever situation you have. 
You, one of the things, one of the first uh, things that I highlighted, and I don't think that, I don't think I had heard you talk about this, uh, is stories are the original scalable technology, allowing you to deeply touch endless numbers of people at once. And there was something really beautiful about that because you, it, I, I was telling you before we w- got on the show, I had a lot of emotions reading your book um, because I know for me personally, I mean, I can be a hell of a storyteller, but when it comes to intentional, like editing, uh, that is, it's just, it's uncomfortable for me. It, um, sometimes I feel uh, I've experienced other people where it feels inauthentic and, you know, or, or you have this belief that, um, you know, you're a great storyteller because you're just gifted. And when you write any of these stories, that's just how it comes out and not realizing that there is a discipline and a process to refining it. And, and there was something, there was something just provocative about that idea of it's a scalable, it's a scalable technology. And there is something Anyway, I just I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, where did that idea come from or just even what comes up for you as I Mm -hmm. share that quote? If you think about the business world, because so much of my work is there, I'm working with leaders who are trying to think, how am I connecting with people that may not be physically around me or even in the same country? Or how do I leave an impression when I'm not even with them, that they're they're off on their own. And that's where this idea came from. You know, a great story is the one that's repeated over mm-hmm. and over. And it's the mm-hmm. things that people talk about and that they know. And you get that right. And that's what we remember. And that's why it stays with us. Um, but to debunk the, you know, I can't do this. I intentionally tell a story very early on about a very awkward business dinner that I was at and I <laughs> self-attested I love that story. And socially awkward introvert, which I think people find funny because they see me speak or they see me one-on-one and they're like, no, you're not. I'm like, oh, sure I am. The worst moments for me are when I book a keynote and they're like, can you join us for dinner? And I'm like, yeah, I would love to. And they go, oh, great. You're going to have all these stories for us. And I'm like, oh, please keep your expectations low. I am not the center of attention at your table, but one-on-one, we'll have amazing conversation. So what I've learned is I am an introvert that doesn't do well with small talk. And the reason Mm -hmm. is that... um, I, I want meaningful conversation and connection. And a lot of small talk can feel not meaningful. Mm-hmm. It just feels like it's filler. And so it's very hard to do. And my mind will go completely blank. So I'm at my first business dinner in my professional career. I did not want to be there. The purpose of the dinner was for my company and another company to, to explore collaborating. And I volunteered to go to this dinner because I thought, if I go to this dinner, I won't have to go again for like a few more years. So I'm going to go and get this over with so I don't have to do it again. This was my literal thought process. So you take that socially awkward introvert paired with the other company. I was just prepared to have them come and like do this sales pitch. And so first business center, I have no frame of reference. I'm thinking they're just going to come in like, you know, the, the salesperson that's like radiating the urge to sell, like the way, you know, Dracar <laughs> radiates off yeah. of people. I'm like, okay, this is going to be miserable. And we're at this table and sure enough, it is so awkward. All of the other tables are having lively conversation and we're looking over at them like, can I be at that table? Anytime anyone tried to get any type of conversation going, it just would fall apart like a helium balloon that's like yeah. singing to the floor <laughs> on its last day. And in my head, I'm like, yep, this sucks. I knew it. Thank goodness I won't have to do this again for a few more years. One of the people at the table clears his throat. His name was Aaron. And he said, I'm building a deck on the back of my house. There is a literal exhale at the table. And we all lean forward because thankfully, someone is starting a conversation. Not at all what I thought would happen at a business center. But tell us about this deck, Aaron. And he's talking about how he had to relocate a wood pile because he was framing and the the pile was in the way. He would put it in a wheelbarrow and take it to the edge of the yard. And on the third pass, he takes a log off the sack 
and is face to face with a raccoon. <laughs> He's frozen. The raccoon is frozen. They both have their hands up like they're under arrest. You know, the raccoon has this mask around its face. So it's only even more ironic. And they're in a draw. And he doesn't know what to do. And at this point, Arte was laughing. Like, can you even, what would you do? After about a minute, he starts to back away and the raccoon runs off. But that was the shift that we needed because then people start asking him all of these questions. Someone else at the table started sharing a story about an unwanted house guest. Mm. And now we're the table that all the other tables are looking at. And I thought... I wonder if this is his go-to move. Mm. Like, is this Aaron's go-to story for a sales conversation? But I realized it didn't matter because what happened is I felt like he was approachable. I felt like he was Mm. a friend. And every time he called me, I took his call. Mm. Now, I went into that dinner not wanting to be there, not wanting the sleazy sales pitch. And that story showed me like, oh, you can actually create connection in like the most inauthentic of situations. And I was not the one telling the story. And in yeah. fact, I, I was the one probably contributing nothing verbally to that. So it's, you know, I... I loved reading about that story and that that theme of connection be, that you echo throughout was something that resonated with me because when I think about times where I tuned out because somebody was telling a story, right? Like at a situ, you know, like a situation like a dinner, it can be a oh good. And then sometimes you get the person who's I'm going to do my 10 minute comedian set and I'm just going to keep telling stories and not have it be a moment of connection and exploration and authentic sharing. Uh, or or there are other times when uh, it feels inauthentic. You're like, I don't, I mean, you're telling the story, but I don't. And the thing that w- became clear in reading your book is when I thought about the times when I experienced somebody and it felt authentic, is, is it because it it did feel like it was intentional about building a relationship or connecting or I want to help you understand or see something differently versus uh, look at me and look at how funny I am or look at me and look at how smart I am. And and honestly, for me, I, I think that's sometimes why I struggle with my own storytelling is because I forget or I'm not as intentional about how do I make sure that this is really going to serve the people I'm sharing. Well, first, I've experienced your stories. I've been in the back of the room and I've heard your stories. And I think everyone listening would agree with me. No one would ever give you the label of inauthentic. Um, I think that we all, myself included, have something we feel a connection to and we see it and we feel it and we want to impart that on the audience and that's why we're sharing a story and sometimes we do that and it works yeah and you're like yes and sometimes we do it and it just doesn't work the way we wanted we don't make enough of a connection for the audience or maybe we're telling it before they're really ready yeah and These are things that we can tweak. These are things that can be done to make sure how am I thinking about who this is and how who I'm telling this to and how I can really take this thing that that has meaning to me and have it make meaning to them. Yeah. And I think about the times where I've gotten it wrong. It's because I got the audience wrong. I did the planning, but my understanding of the audience was wrong and what I did didn't work. That's such a good that's such a good point of. Yeah, knowing where they're at, and they might not be ready for for that story, uh, or it might not be the right time, or or whatever the case might be, from a standpoint of, yeah, just that that timing is interesting. The uh, I appreciate that that feedback uh, on being authentic, and there's also an opportunity from uh, to refine. I. <laughs> I don't remember if this came up in our last interview, so if it did, forgive me, audience. I I joke, and some of this is my ADHD, that I'm uh I'm you know how like Jackson Five is like they were always the like first take Jackson, you know yeah. it was like they could do it on one take. I I laugh that I think of myself and not in a good way. I don't mean this is good, like first draft Noel. Like I do a first draft, and then I'm like, well, okay, like. <laughs> 
that's as good as it's going to be. Yeah, same. And, and there was something, there was a couple of things that I quoted. And I'm like, I need to put these on post-it notes that you wrote. The first is, great storytellers learned to become great storytellers. They didn't just become it. And uh, great stories are never fully baked. You can't create an, I mean, this is kind of throughout a couple of chapters. You can't create and edit at the same time. Uh, and you just need to start with an idea. And those were the things that I found myself going, why is that so hard? And I know I'm not alone in that. But what has been your experience when you're working with somebody like me, who doesn't think of themselves as a storyteller, maybe is rushing through it? Uh, yeah, just like how what and let me actually let me rephrase it. What are the most common patterns you see get in people's way of being able to connect with their authentic storytelling selves? Let me start with that question. Okay, but I want to go back to what you Yeah, said you can go back to the other one. We can go wherever um, we want. I think that you know, when I say you can't create it at the same time and stories aren't fully baked and you just start an idea with an idea that was meant to be freeing and not a burden yeah. that yeah. was meant to help you recognize that you are never in the first pass going to get the plot the details relatable characters things that are in the story that engage the brain in the compelling way and tell it with just the right tension and you know your whole body language and pause and dramatic like you're just not going to do that which is why there's a methodical approach in how you can do that. Over time, you you figure out your pieces and you get better at it. You come from a background in improv and you know that the beauty of improv is you do it in the moment and yeah. it is what it is. But you learn as you're doing improv each time, mm. oh gosh, I can, I can just dial that up just mm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I can try this or mm. I can try that. And that one shift, that one phrase can make all the difference. And to bring it back to your second question, it's all about ultimately creating understanding for your audience. So mm. I don't care if you call yourself a storyteller or not, but I do know that you really care about communicating in a way that is meaningful for people. And that's all we're trying to do. Mm. We're wrapping information in a brain friendly way. That's yeah. all this is. And some of it is, you know, I, I touch on a lot of the science and some new science when we share information, we're imparting it, and each person has to think what do they do with it and how do they file that in their brain. Yeah. But what a story does is it provides filing suggestions. Mm. So the mm. challenge anytime mm. we're communicating or sharing data is that each of us are doing an interpretation of what that is. And my interpretation is different than yours and someone else's because we're making assumptions about what we're seeing and hearing based on our experiences, which are all different. And when there's no way to guide people through that, you're risking completely different understandings. But when you are providing filing suggestions, you have a better chance of people getting it. And so if we take like job interviews as an example, if you just list your experience, that interviewer is going to have their own bias and thoughts of how that experience fits into the company and what that is worth and what value there is and what the impact is based on what they know. But if you tell a story and you communicate that, you're now providing filing suggestions for how might this person fit into this company and how mm. are they complementary, but where are they different? And like it just it creates more meaning and it takes less load off the audience. That's that's such a powerful reframe. And and th and that's what you know why I can't recommend your book enough is it just helps you think about something that's sort of been around for millennia, you know, for ages and ages and to understand what is it about it. You know, it's not just oh, yeah, a lot of times when we think in stories, like it's it's we're wrapping I love that that phrase you used of we're wrapping understanding around the brain and what we know about the brain. And that you and you know me, I love that uh, the brain science. And when you were on the when you were on our show last time, you had just started to we like touched a little bit on the five factory settings of the yeah. brain. But I want to come back to them because uh, it, it, they're just so valuable. And for anyone, it doesn't matter if you're doing a performance. I mean, we all we all have moments where we're wanting to influence, 
where we're wanting to build a connection, where we're wanting to, and without understanding the factory settings, to use your language, uh, we can miss the mark. So can we run down the factory settings? Do you, need, you I mean, I know you yeah. know them, but do you yeah, want yeah. me to, yeah. can we start the first one is my favorite. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first is that your brain is lazy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Number one goal is to keep your body alive and your brain is the banker uh, in many ways, the banker of calories for your body. Mm-hmm. Some are non-negotiable. Some are going to go for breathing, digestion, you know, circulation, really important things. But there's this discretionary fund that it's a real miserly banker on that is attention and focus and immersion and effort and flow. These are discretionary things. The brain makes the choice of, is this worth granting calories to, or is mm. it too predictable? Is it too flat? Have I heard this so many times before? Right? We've all started streaming something and 15 minutes in, it's not holding our attention yeah. or you abandon a book or you're listening to a speaker and it's just not the right message, the right time. And you drift off and you start making your grocery list and you start planning your weekend. And that's not that you're not a good listener or that you're a bad person. It's that that's what we're meant to do. We're not meant to be fully immersed all day, every day. Our brain is meant to come in and go out. And so anytime that we're communicating, not limited to storytelling, you have to be aware that, that there's a neuroscientist that Dr. Paul Zak, he said um, that people will either listen to what you have to say or they'll go watch cat videos. <laughs> like, that sums it up, right? If you're not being compelling enough. And so specifically, what it means is if you're not constructing a story that is so vivid that we can see it, even if we've never experienced it, we can we can feel like we're alongside the characters and we can feel the emotion of what it's like, then the brain's going to be like, this might be a good time for us to, to peace out. Mm-hmm. Um, and Or it just might be too predictable. It doesn't mean you're not listening or you're not paying attention. What it does mean, though, is that your brain isn't as engaged and it won't necessarily release, um, it won't necessarily result in the outcomes that we want. Yeah, yeah. And this pairs with the next two because the brain is always making these assumptions like we talked about. Mm -hmm. So some of it is watching what's happening around us. It's things like, how am I setting my foot when I'm going downstairs? But it's also making assumptions about what we're consuming. So anytime someone starts a story, you try to guess the ending, right? We try Mm -hmm. to guess what's happening in the book or movie, but we do the same thing in communications. We think like, where's this going? Is this meaningful? Or if a chart is put up, what does this mean to me? And when you are composing stories, this is a choice of, am I going to lean into assumptions or am I going to slow them down? Mm. So leaning into an assumption mm. is something like, if I, if I tell you that the character came from a town with one stoplight, you're going to have assumptions about what that means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, if I put in something that is unexpected and makes your brain hit a speed bump, then it pays attention both ways, right? The brain is always going to be there doing it. So you either want to challenge it or harness it. So yeah. comedians do this with the challenge where you're following along in the joke and then they hit the zinger. Yeah. It's completely different than you expect. Yeah. So where you can put in unexpected words or phrases or build up the tension and put plot points in, you know, have it reveal itself in a way that's not expected, you're going to get even more calorie spent. The faster the brain can make these assumptions, the faster it can conserve calories. We always want to be responding and not reacting. Mm-hmm. And responding is much more efficient on the body. Reacting is very expensive and draining. And so mm-hmm. it's part of what we're naturally going to do. And you have to harness that. And these assumptions come from our experiences. We're making these predictions subconsciously based on this library of files in our long-term memory of things that we've done, experiences that we've had. So you want to put things in the story that are really relatable so the audience can understand it without even having to think it. So if I say, you know, he had a small incision, we would have different opinions about mm-hmm. what small means mm-hmm. and what the incision looks like. But if I say to you, the incision was the size of a paper clip, mm. you immediately get that. You can picture it without even having to think like, well, how big is that? 
So when you could put in metaphors mm. and specific examples mm. like that, you were just getting free real estate in the brain. And you're almost like, it's the Jedi mind trick. You're putting this idea in their head that they don't know about. So those first three work together. If the brain's lazy, it's making assumptions that it can try to respond and conserve calories. And all those assumptions and predictions are based on our experiences. And so what you put in the story impacts that. Mm. The last two go hand in hand. Uh, if you think about the last networking event you went to where you didn't know anyone, you walk into the room and you start looking around and your brain subconsciously is trying to figure out who to go up to and talk to. And if you're like me, you're like, no, no, <laughs> no, no. And you're just searching for like, who seems friendly? Who seems safe? And that's because we seek in groups and out groups. Yeah. And groups are those that share similar values or experiences or even aspirations, right? In sales, it's that I'll have what she's having. I want that. Um, and out groups are where we notice our differences, which charities use all the time when yeah. they tell the natural disaster, the story of one person impacted by it, and they're struggling for clothing, food, shelter. You're experiencing that story while you're in electricity and you have clothing, food, and shelter, and you realize how different your experiences are. So you have a choice in your story of, do you want your audience to feel a part of something or something that they aspire to, or do you want them to notice their differences or both? You know, a, a company that's going through a change needs to tell a story that is outgroup, helping the, the employees recognize why they can't stay where they are, why they have to make the changes that they're doing. And the last is that at our most simple level, we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Mm -hmm. We've got the cocktail of pleasure neurochemicals like your serotonin, dopamine, co um, serotonin, dopamine, and, and oxytocin that are released in moments of connection and bonding. These are the ones that you get goosebumps when someone's telling you a story and you just feel it. Um, there's also cortisol and adrenaline, which are released in moments of focus, which can be your horror movie or something mm -hmm. where you are just feeling that anticipation. And when we listen to stories, we do go through neurochemical shifts. So you have a choice of, are you telling a feel-good story? Are you telling an uncomfortable story or both? So you start to put all five together and now you're making choices of what are you putting in the story that catches attention, leans into or slows assumptions, creates immediate understanding, is a feel good or uncomfortable story and helps people feel a part of something or different. And now you can start to see like, yeah, the brain's going to pay attention to that depending on what you do. Yeah, the a, a, a connection that was coming up as you were talking about the fourth one, the in-group and out-group. I really ap appreciate the intentionality of how do I do this so they can see themselves in it? Or how do I share a story of how, th how things are different? And I'm curious to get your thoughts. Uh, I'm thinking of a few situations a and, and I'll own that there have been times when I've absolutely done this. Uh, when you're not thinking about your audience, you might unintentionally or intentionally tell a story that places your audience in an out group, um, but not in a way that what you're talking about, because what you're talking about is being really intentional about, am I, am I wanting people to understand someone's experience that's different than them? Or am I wanting them to understand an experience that's familiar to them? And there are times, you know, I'd, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you a situation. <laughs> right? It was the heat of the pandemic. Uh, mental health challenges were through the roof, through the roof. And I was brought into an organization to just talk about. And the, uh, the person who was introducing me, um, unbeknownst to me, put together like a 15 minute presentation, like his own little pre keynote. No, the presentation wasn't on me. No, it was I, like, I'm okay. making assumptions about where mm -hmm. this is going. Sorry. And 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 the the stories he was telling came from such an incredible place of privilege. And also I wanted like context. This is also happening after George Floyd, George Floyd's murder, where yeah. we are very conscious. Let me rephrase that, where many more people and many more white people were conscious of and and it just 
I think what I'm realizing is part of what, you know, struck me about this doesn't feel good or right yeah. is because it was it was so focused on an incredible amount of financial privilege, an incredible amount of exclusion of this special group that he was a part of that you can only be part of if you had money and whatever. And essentially what happened, I, I can go back now and go, I was outgrouped, you know, we all were like, this doesn't, you're not reading the, you know, like, and, um, and so I think that that's a watch out too of, and, you know, and personally, I have to be aware of it as, as I try to talk about and bring in more conversations from an inclusion perspective, I have to be careful that it's not always through a white lens because right. it will often be because that's my lived experience, right? So right. Th that I, that's just a connection I'm making as I'm hearing you talk about it that I didn't in the book that I think is actually a profound thing to be paying attention to of how might the story I'm telling and am I okay that it might make some people feel excluded? Maybe I might actually, you know, yeah. like if you've never experienced this, like I might be okay that you're uncomfortable with it. But other times, uh, could shut it, it for me personally, anyway, it totally shut me down. It turned me off in a major way. Yeah. This is where testing is key because we often don't see those blind sides and those yeah. moments, but what you're describing is a risk. Um, there may be, you know, we're, our goal always is to present to the most excited person in the room, meaning that if you're doing a presentation to a hundred people and 99 are generally interested and there's one that is on the leadership team and is a naysayer and isn't bought in and you find yourself skewing your presentation to that one like that's not the thing to do right we don't want to yeah. present to the margins we want to present to the majority and um so there may be cases where you're like, yeah, I'm okay if some of these people are out group and, and there's intentional reasons about that. But what you described, I was working with um, attorneys and one of them shared a story about a attorney that was presenting to jurors and was trying to be really relatable and was talking about some shopping trip. And I don't have all the details right, but the gist of it was he was in Las Vegas and went to buy a purse for his wife and ended up buying what was a very expensive purse. And the story could not have landed with a louder thud than <laughs> anything else because he totally alienated himself from yeah. the jurors. He didn't relate to them in any way. It screamed privilege. There was nothing meaningful in it. And then from that moment on, he lost lost him because it doesn't matter what he yeah. says. I feel different from him. It, there's a difference between I've now lost trust because that's kind of what happened, right? Yeah. I've lost trust yeah. in anything this person has to say. There's a difference from that and what you're doing because the work that we do is a professional agitator mm. to bring change mm. in organizations and to shape culture and to have them grapple with the difficult things. You have to have an agitator that is taking people through this in a thoughtful way. So there are uncomfortable stories. There are moments of outgroup in that journey. Yeah. It's just being thoughtful of how do I not leave them there and how do I help them feel a part of an in-group and move to a place where they're not still sitting in an uncomfortable moment. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully said, beautifully said. I'm excited to continue on with your book and I'm, I'm in chapter six. And the thing that I love in your four through five is when you start getting into the practices. So I love, I love theory, but I love tools. And I, I so appreciate all of the prompts and all of the ways to think about the ideas and the questions that you ask. Um, I don't even, I just want, Karen, I just want this whole conversation to be like, here's what I loved about your book. I'm like, I don't even, <laughs> well, you, like, you want to talk about it? I'm just going to tell you parts of your book that I thought were really brilliant and amazing. <laughs> Let me ruin really, That's you. what this is turning into of like, now, you know, what, what do you want to add to your brilliant, you know, insights or whatever. Let me ruin is. for you. Um, it's a second half book. Like the first half is good. It gives you the foundation that you need, but it really rocks in the second half because now we've got the foundation and now we can get into the fun. Yeah. So um, the good stuff is still to come for what it's worth. I thing, know I'm excited about that. But I just with what I've gotten to, yeah. you know, the thinking, you know, because people are, well, I don't have good stories. Well, I don't know where I should pull from them or I'm not creative or and and it's not just that you say, well, think about your own life or think about your professional life or think about people around you or think about your clients. 
each of those areas you follow up with, you know, 10 good questions to just start exploring. And that, that made me really excited to go. And now it's doing the, doing the work of like, oh, okay. Like what, what does come up? So I'm, no, I'm excited. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like my what, favorite. What do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. So my favorite moments, because uh, I tested it with a lot of skeptics and people that felt like they couldn't tell stories mm. or didn't need to. And without fail, every single time they would get to that chapter where it is, how do you find ideas, which is meant to, to ideas come from constraints. They don't come from a blank page. It's too hard in that moment when you're trying to think of a story and you're backed up against a deadline, your brain doesn't know which file to access, but a prompt narrows it Mm. and it helps you tap into Mm. all of this stuff. Mm. And so I wanted to give different categories of that to help. And without fail, every single person would come back and be like, you know, you might be onto something here (laughs) because it made me think of things I didn't think of. Um, I guess what I want to say is the question that is the most surprising to me is why did you include checklists in the book? Which is just so, yeah, oh, interesting. So my brain funny ab- to me. I appreciated the check. <laughs> right? So <laughs> I come from a background of instructional design and adult learning in psychology. And what good is it to learn the things in the chapter and then you have the book on your shelf and you remember, oh my gosh, I want to tell a eulogy. Let me remember how to go do that. And then try to remember what chapter that's in and try to find the place again. Like that's a nightmare. So people are like, that's so amazing you did that. I'm like, it's a summary of what's in the chapter. Okay, let's be clear. I'm not giving you bonus content that we didn't cover. It's just in one place. But I, my goal is I want any person to recognize they can do this and this guide you through step by step. You're not always going to have to go through every step. You're not always going to have to do it in this way, but it's going to take you through it so that you can figure out what does work for you and how to play with it. And so there's generic stuff, but then it does get into telling stories for job interviews, telling yeah. an eulogy, giving a yeah. wedding toast, things like that. Yeah. And then the other thing I'll say is what we haven't touched on. I felt like it was really important for people not just to hear from me. I want mm-hmm. them to know mm-hmm. there's so many different ways to tell stories. So I interviewed a co-founder from the Sundance Institute, mm-hmm. an executive producer at The Moth, a creative director at Pixar, the TED Radio Hour podcast host, you know, a neuroscientist, an improv comedian. There's a different role for each chapter. Some of them are stories and some of them are a peek into their world. And to me, like, I love all of them because you hear how Sundance approaches Mm -hmm. manuscripts for films and what Mm -hmm. that's like. And so you're not only getting this process, but you're getting different perspectives on it and you get tips on what to try. Yeah, the I, I forget her name, but the woman from Moth. That Sarah, was one. Yeah. Yeah. When I was reading that, I thought, I want, I want somebody like that in my life. And then I thought, oh, it's Karen. I'll just hire Karen <laughs> to help me do it. <laughs> well, I felt that way with every interview. In fact, this is, um, I'm still doing some of those interviews and I still have some that, you know, unfortunately, when you're publishing a book, you are only allowed a certain page limit just to, yeah make it economical so that people will buy it. It's already so expensive to buy books these days. So um, I love doing these interviews to bring them to people because to me, it's that what's in her bag that we used to read in magazines. It's just a fun look into someone's world and how they're approaching it. So I'm looking for a publication that wants to make this a regular column so I can put it in there. And just interview amazing people and just, you know, like to talk with them about... One of the things that was such a gift uh, when you and I had the privilege of of speaking at a similar event, which FYI here, I'm just going to do a super shameless plug. Karen and I actually like met and built our relationship during the pandemic online. And we've we declared ourselves the awkward duets because we got on Zoom and we're playing videos we would love to do an awkward duet keynote. So if you can just bring us both to an amazing location, 
you know, pay for our travel. We will put together an incredible keynote that has to do with all things. So there's our my shameless plug. But let okay, me, back. let me just expand because <laughs> you said awkward duets, but you didn't say what it was. We're not singing. For the yeah, record. no, we're not singing. Oh yeah, just to be clear, <laughs> it would be an awkward duet with an accordion and a piccolo. So first of all, audience draw right there. Yeah. But second of all, it would touch on trust and psychological safety and storytelling and it would be this incredibly motivating entertaining mm-hmm. wonderful uh leadership based talk mm-hmm. so let's make it a happen near you yeah <laughs> That's our, that's our. I'm sorry. There's something when you're like a piccolo and accordion. It's just what an audience wants. Needs to be our tagline. We need to. <laughs> uh, okay, but going back to your keynotes, one of the things you do, and we talked about, we'll play with here, is Karen brings somebody up who has a story that they're. Well, it's not even in the one that I observed. It wasn't even a story with a purpose. It was just, what's a story? No, I just bring someone up and they don't know why. Yeah, they don't. That's right. We'll do it live. But I did this for a group of mediators. Um, I usually go by volunteers because whoever volunteers is comfortable enough to be on stage. And the prompt that you'll see is I ask someone to think of a vacation experience that they had. And then we work through it to show how you can work a story and make it better. Um, the person that volunteered in this particular case, I said, okay, think of a vacation story. He said, I have one. I said, great. Can you just give me, you know, two sentences on it? He said, yes. It's about the time I was in Russian prison. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> never know who's going to come up and how it's going to go, but it's always entertaining. <laughs> and then, And then the process is you have them share it. Yep. And then you ask them questions to bring it to life and to yep. help them think about it. And then they share it again and you get to see this beautiful before and after moment. And and it was magic to watch you do that. It was so fun to see the collective audience sort of that tension build of how is this going to work out? Is it is she going to land the ship, so to speak, right? Is she going to land this? And and then it was brilliant. So we thought that it would be, uh, you know, selfishly, I'll get some uh, free support and coaching from Karen <laughs> on this call. Heck yeah, it's more yeah. fun. So were you in Russian prison? <laughs> I wasn't. Okay. Um, I mean, Amy, if you want to go along those lines, I was, I've only been arrested once in my life. Okay. So it's your choice. We can use any story. It could be a vacation adventure or it could be a story you you want to tell in a keynote that we play with. Mm. Now, let's let's actually talk about a vacation story. Okay. Um, last year, I, uh, you know, and I don't know who the audience is. So this is just going to be Doesn't playing matter. the story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, last year, I. No, wait. Let's do something that's going to be coming up. Okay. So my brother's never been to Disney World or Disneyland, and it was his birthday on St. Patrick's Day. And so his wife gifted him a trip to Disneyland, and Nick and I will be joining them. That's, I'm really, that's a trip I'm super excited about. That is exciting. So let me ask some clarifying things because it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the selection of the trip or the anticipation or how we found out about it? Like, where do you want to go? Sure. We can talk about, we can talk about the selection and the anticipation. All right. So give us, you know, the 60 second version of that, of how it came to be. Yeah. So his wife and uh, my sister-in-law, who I think is amazing, Mariana, loves Disney. And that would be a place that they would go with her family from because uh, she grew up in Mexico. So they would, they would fly up to Disneyland. And so she and I bonded over that. And uh, and in February of or excuse me, in March of 2020, we had a trip planned for the five of us. So Nick and I and the two of them and their son um, to go. And then obviously that had to get canceled. So about six months ago, it was we're making this happen. And Mariana is so creative that she created this beautiful little envelope, this watercolor of the castle. And he got it at midnight on the 17th. And at 1221, I get a text from him. That's just a picture of the castle. And my response was, oh, what's that? And he's like, you know what it is. (laughs) He's like, let's go. 
<laughs> and uh, so there was a lot of anticipation and secrecy between Mariana and I. And, uh, and now it's really exciting now that he knows. Oh, that's so fun. Um, I'm debating the order I want to go in. Okay, just to be clear, I added yeah. way more details just because I'm in your presence and I'm thinking about them. So. <laughs> Not at all. So let's start with the emotions of it. So mm-hmm. let's talk about as you and Mariana started talking about this and bring us into tell that story again and bring us into what were you all feeling both in the deciding and lead up and what happens when you get the text? Like, what was that whole experience like? Yeah, so... When we were secretly talking, one, it's fun to plan something exciting for somebody in secret. It's fun to be in the know of what's going to be a really fun surprise. And, and so there was a lot of um, what I would describe as <laughs> giggly text messages <laughs> to each other <laughs> of September 2024. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just every time she sent a photo of the gift that she was making for him, um, I don't, there was something that felt really special. And then, and then on a peripheral level, Nick and I were are super excited for him to experience the Star Wars land, right? And so uh, that brings up a lot of emotions. But I, uh, you, you know, for people who are watching the video, you can even see it on my face. The minute I got that text, it was just like, yeah. Now we can now we can talk about it. Now we can be excited about it. And now now it's just on. Like so let's talk about what you just said because you started right away with two really important sentences. Okay. You said it's really fun to be secretly planning with someone. Mm. So that right away makes an immediate connection to, oh, I get what that is. That's yeah. like the paper, the incision is the size of a paper clip. Yeah. You're immediately having us connect to that feeling without having to say what it feels like. Like, oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah. That's an instant like, oh, now we feel that. And now we're a little giggly, which was your next sentence, right? How fun is it to have these giggly text messages? So now we're starting to experience the mood and the feeling of it. And we're getting some even more dynamic details as you start to go through. So let's do it again. And this time talk about, um, <laughs> I was playing with something and I dropped it. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about what would we see, hear, feel, smell if we were alongside you or Mariana as this unfolds? Mm. Like, like as we get into the trip or what? No, no. In this, in this beginning stages, like yeah. as you're doing all of this, like make us feel like we're standing alongside you and experiencing it. Yeah. So every time that I would get a message from her of something she was plotting, I would smile and turn my phone to Nick so he could see what was happening. I would send her photos of different Disney bags that we might we might purchase. And I, I know that she desperately wanted this rose gold bag because she has these rose gold ears. And so I just went ahead and got it for her. And it was so fun to be able to send her the text and say, I may have bought this for you. <laughs> and, and her response being, I'll, I'll give it back to you. I'll take good care of it. And my response being, don't worry, I bought myself one too, so we can be bag twins. And then to find her uh, sending images of just fun little accessories that she's gotten for us to be able to use. And and here's what's kind of cool about it. So while the trip is with the four of us, uh, my sister Becky is, and I know she'll be doing the transcript, but she's she's my like my Disney sister. And so Mariana and I have been, you know, putting out into the universe, we're going to get this now because it's going to be when the sisters take a trip. So we're not just enjoying planning for this trip or envisioning a future trip for sisters. See how we took this story that's a surprise for your brother and he gets to have this. And now we've gotten all these other details where I guarantee you some listener is going to be like, can you please send a photo with the rose gold backpack? (laughs) (laughs) And when are you taking this trip? So what we did is we took the core basic part of a story and started to put these more specific things into it that are going to make the brain pay attention. They're leaning into our assumptions, right? By talking about Disney, you're leaning into our assumptions of what we feel and know about Disney. And then you're giving us these specific moments. Mm. Do you want to put it together and just pull a few of these things together into a thing of whatever you remember? Yeah, sure. 
So my brother's birthday is on St. Patrick's Day, and he got a really special gift that his his wife, Mariana, who's, you know, she's the golden child in our family. <laughs> uh, and I say that with love because she's just great. Um, that we've been planning for six months, and it's actually a do-over of a trip because we had planned this for March of 2020 for his birthday and everyone knows what went down there. So it was pretty sad to lose that. And since that time, actually, Drew has been really wanting to right get back there and find this trip. And so uh, it's one of my favorite things I realize in life is planning something special for someone in secret, because not only do you get the joy of when you reveal it to them, but you get all the joy in the leading up. And so Mariana and I would send each other text messages of, you know, places we were going to visit, where we might uh, eat and plotting what we we're going to wear. And I knew that she always wanted the this rose gold uh, bag. And so it was great to be able to send her a message and say, I may have gotten you. And her response being, it's okay, I'll take good care of it. And me going, I don't care what you do with it because I got myself one too. <laughs> and, well uh, done. Yeah, thanks. You're amazing. No, You're you did it. You did it. And there's something that you did that I want to also point out. Our inclination sometimes is to um, we hear the word you is really powerful. So you could have said, do you know how um, it's really great to plan a trip for someone that doesn't know about it and you, 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 you. Um, we don't like being told what to do. Yeah. Like if you're like, you know, think about those moments when you've planned a trip for someone. That doesn't work yeah. a lot of times in communications and stories because as you're listing the think about, think about, think about, if our mental story isn't matching what you're saying, we get frustrated. But wait, I'm not doing that. Like, I, I'm trying to plan this and what you're saying is different. But when you tell your version, when you tell your story, we immediately hear yours, relate to yours, and have our own version running yeah. in our head. Yeah. So when people say, I'm hesitant to use my own story or I, I don't want to make it about me, Sometimes it's the fact that you do make it about you in service of the audience that they relate to it more. Yeah. And it's and it's building out that color because that was something too that you talked about in the book that I highlighted was when stories, one of the reasons stories fall flat is because the speaker is talking about their feelings about the story, essentially, instead of telling the story in service of the audience. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that because that's something that it also it's like, well, don't tell a story about you. Well, sometimes that's a good story. It just, again, like you said, it needs to be purposeful right. and bringing the people along because that was another fun, that was another fun science fact that you shared of, I knew about neurocoupling. I knew that we experience what other people experience or we can. What was new to me was the fact that somebody retelling the story to someone else, they will also have a similar experience. And there's a part of me that when we think about that impact, that not only in how you show up with your stories can impact somebody emotionally, it can then impact other people, which I see this. I see this all the time. One of my favorite stories to tell clients of a client of ours, and he was a former guest is this leader, Jeff Anderson, I can say his name because we shared it publicly, is uh, he said, you know, Sarah, he wasn't talking to me, you know, the th he was telling Teresa, you know, the thing that keeps me up at night as a leader is the fact that everyone wakes up and is suffering just by being human. And I think, how do we make sure we don't contribute to that suffering at work? And I can see, I, I feel the feelings again. And I see the other person like, who is that? And how do I work for that leader? So there's an awesome responsibility and an awesome, like, uh, opportunity to, to really create lasting impact, uh, in what you're telling. If you do it well, there's not only this 
neural coupling where the brain activity mirrors each other, but heart rates will sink. Mm -hmm. People have been in different cities hearing stories at different times and they still, they'd hear the same story, but they'd still experience that same synchronization. And, you know, sometimes the question comes up about what about virtual? It's not, it's not, I mean, yes, there is often an energy in a room, right? You can feel mm -hmm. things like that. But this still can happen virtually. It just comes down to being intentional and in how are you creating meaning for people? Mm. And that's the hardest thing because, we do have very full days and we are asked to put stuff together at the last minute. And so the average person opens up their existing PowerPoint deck and they start making the PowerPoint quilt, as I like to say, yeah. of this slide and this slide <laughs> and this slide. And they perfect the deck and they spend maybe five minutes thinking about what they're yeah. going to say. Yeah. And we need to flip that. We need to start first with the audience and what they need and then think about what to say. And yes, it probably is more work than just getting up and sharing data or getting up and speaking, but the return is far greater and mm -hmm. you're going to get more payoff and reward. And so we need to flip this mindset of it's going to take me so much longer. Like, no, it's not. It's actually going to save you time in the long run because you're wasting so much time today. Yeah. What a beautiful place for us to, to wind down. Karen Eber, The Perfect Story. How can people... What, uh, what's the best places for them to purchase your book and how can they connect with you? The book is everywhere books are sold in hard copy, audio book and ebook. You can find it anywhere. And my website also has those links, which is my name, K-A-R-E-N-E-B-E-R. -E -E you can also reach out to me through my website for our hashtag awkward duets. <laughs> <laughs> and again, or take Sarah's. us somewhere amazing <laughs> and pay for our travel. Um, and it's going to be epic. Whoever God. makes this leap, it is going to be epic. It's And there may be t-shirts. There may be awkward duet t-shirts. No, there will be. There will be. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> Karen, I adore you. I love you. I'm so... Just congratulations again. I know we've chatted since your book has published, but it's been such a treat. It's been such a treat and such a visual gift to read your stories because you're such a phenomenal storyteller that I now know and understand you've had to learn, which means I can learn it too. So you thank can. you so much, my dear. Thank you. Our guest this week has been Karen Eber. And while I'm chewing on a number of things and looking forward to working with her, I really found that conversation about being intentional with your conversations to either create an in-group or to create an out-group, and then to be very thoughtful when you might be doing that unintentionally. I don't know that I've ever thought about that in the way that I did in reading her book. And I'm so excited for people to read her book. So definitely check it out. And we want to hear from you. What resonated for you? What came up for you? Uh, send us a message at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com where I read and respond to every message we receive. If you want to support the show, you can do so by becoming a patron. Your financial support will support the team that makes this show possible. Just go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations. Another way you can support us that's super helpful is to be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. Now, let's give some love to the crew that makes this show possible. To our producer, Nick Wilson. To our sound editor, Drew Knoll. To our transcriptionist, Becky Reiner. To our marketing consultant, Jessica Burge. And the rest of the Snowco crew, thank you. And just a final thank you to Karen Eber for coming on, sharing her wisdom, and doing some coaching with me of how to make stories even more powerful. Well, my friends... This has been another episode of Conversations on Conversations. Remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So till next week, please be sure to rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again soon.